Right back at you. Brand new episode of everyone's favorite financial uh, program. Are we a program? Sure. I guess. Everyone's favorite financial program. What are your thoughts? That's Michael Batnick with the headband. I'm downtown Josh Brown. No, I am not wearing a Targaryen wig. This is my actual hair. Um, for, for, anyone, for anyone wondering, I am not um, part of House Targaryen. Yeah, that um, was that was a hell of an opening episode. Oh my god! Uh, it was very calculated to cause outrage. The, oh my god. the the birth scene that was a was lot. Like, that was a lot. It was. I actually did. You ever? Did you look away? I looked away. Uh, yeah, I, I went. I did one of these too. It's too. It's it was a little, it was a little bit too much. I thought all the actors were really good, like somebody in the chat's calling me a macaroni penguin. I'll take it. I'll own it. Oh my oh, I, god! I have yellow oh eyebrows. My god! Oh my god! <laughs> I'll take it. It's okay. It's okay. I got th- I got thick skin, my friends. All right, who's here? James Sykes, Alec Upchurch, David Wasaki is here. Sean Graylish, uh, MD, Midwest Cannabis. Shout out to Luther, having a lot of fun in the chat tonight. We love you, man. Uh, Reginald Burks is here. Jack Rosenfield. All, the whole gang. Debbie Dantes is here. The whole gang is here. And we're so happy that you guys are back uh, after a one-week hiatus. Um, but we have a lot to cover, so we're going to go right into it after I announce this week's sponsor. Ooh. Today's show is brought to you by... The fine folks at Future Proof, the world's largest wealth festival. What is Future Proof? Tell us what's going on with this. Well, we we were inspired Stretch. to get to get out of the ballroom, mm. off of the panel of, of four dudes talking smart beta, mm. and we're we're there to have fun, right? Mm. We're there to meet meet guys, meet girls. In the words of Ronnie Mund, I don't know if anybody is a Howard fan, but that's what that's what we're there to do. Yeah, it's a it's going to be <clears throat> it's a conference it's a it's a festival. There will be panels, there will be speakers, amazing speakers. Jeff Gunlock's coming. Um, David Booth, all kinds of stuff. But like, the, I feel like the networking is always the, the reason that you have to go to something live as opposed to attending a webinar. And it's so, never enough. It's never enough. Well, I, I could think of like 25 people I know offhand that like I personally saw their careers change from the right introduction or, or meeting with the right people oh, yeah. at an event. I've seen people get funded. I've seen people get hired. Um, I've, I've seen it all and, and I'm on that list. So, uh, if you work in finance or FinTech or financial media or asset management or financial planning, this is like the thing that you can't miss. So check it out at futureprooffest. We've got three. If you're on the fence, get off the fence. Come on. Have get some off fun. The fence. It's filling up. The hotels are, are selling out and it's September 11th. So it's coming up. So make your plans. Okay. Um, let's, I think you're going first. Tonight. I'm, I'm going first. You know, I'm eyeballing this chart from Ryan Dietrich. It's not a chart, it's a table. Oh, congrats to Ryan, by the way. New job at Carson. That's awesome. Love Ryan. Ooh, Carson uh, Carson Wealth? That Carson, yep. Good for him. Very so cool. Ryan posted a table showing every time the S&P 500 was up 12.5% in one month, which is what happened uh, from, I guess, second week of July through through the second week of August. And returns after a run like this are generally pretty damn good. You see some red there, but then, but then I, I just looked, I just took a glance and I saw twelve months later, the it's higher seventy six percent of the time. Josh, I know, and I think you know, the market's always up seventy six percent. Exactly, the, the market yeah. is always up seventy six percent of the time one year later. So this is not not exactly meaningful. Hey, John, chart back on real quick. So it would be cool if there was like another column. That was like, um, that was like showing maybe inflation or showing earnings growth, just for even more context. But I'm sure Ryan is very busy in his new gig. But like, th- I-, I guess outside of the 1974, 75, 82 uh, years, um, this is a pretty out of the ordinary situation. Which one? And the, oh, the I cannot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Situation. yes, yes, yes. There's no, there's no precedent. And like and 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 furthermore, some of these precedents just make no sense at all. Like three thirty one two thousand nine. Right. That's after seventeen months of straight down, uh, down fifty percent. Like this is not that. We're down, I think are, I I think what you what you might say is strip away all the news and just focus on the price. 
I think that's what I kind of have to do. Um, but I do like this visualization. It's helpful. And I think what it really shows is how resilient the stock market is, even after it's had a, a bounce off a low, a really big move off a low. Um, it doesn't mean it has to roll right back over. And as you can see, most of the time it doesn't. Well, if you like that table, I got an even better chart for you. Chart on, please. This is from Yuri and Timmer. All right. Mm. So what we're looking at are all of the previous bear market rallies and where we are today. And as you can see, I guess almost by definition. Sorry, this is like retra the, the retracement of the low. So we've retraced 53% 53 of, of, the, the of the loss. S&P? Yep. Okay. So by definition, bear market rallies have to fail eventually. And I guess what Urian is ultimately saying is that if we were to punch a little bit higher, then it's not a bear market rally because it, there's no precedent for a bounce to retrace so much of the gain or so much of the losses and then roll over. This is such a great, this is really such a great chart. Urian does such fantastic work. So in other words, it, right, the, the, the situations where the market went much higher than 50%, they're not here because they weren't, they didn't turn out to be bear market rallies. Correct. Exactly. They, they would, by definition, not be on this chart. I was talking about Ben today, uh, uh, about this with Ben today. And just to keep things very simple, I think you and I are probably on the same page here. What happened, just describing what happened, how we got from the bottom of June 16th to the to that 53% retracement. People got too bearish. Sentiment, positioning of both individual and professional investors. Inflation expectations peaked and are rolling over. Uh, earnings were better than expected. And then you had, and that, that sparked a rally. And then people chased and we were, and it's now on its course. Is that about right? Yeah, we, I mean, we've had multiple expansion this summer. Why? Like, who, like who knew? Why, why would we have that? But I don't know, but we did. So that's how much people chased. And so the, and rally, the, rally, was, the rally was broad based. I mean, everything bounced, more or less. Look at this next chart. Uh, this is about as high as it gets. And we're looking at the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that were above their 50-day moving average. That went from effectively zero in July, in June and July, up to over 90%. So everything everything participated in the rally like m nothing was left behind stop 90 so 90 percent of stocks this is as of last week yep 90 percent of stocks in the s p were above their 50-day move i think average. i think it was like 92 and then for and then stocks started selling on friday we got some follow-through on monday and what you're seeing are a lot of the earnings that had that were responded favorably they're getting the gaps are getting filled so let's let's go through some of these disney i mean Pretty ugly. So it's if you're like if you're it's pretty ugly. If you're a shareholder and you're like, all right, it, the worst is over. It's pretty ugly. It's, it, this is tough, man. What do you? What is this about? It's like I'll tell you, you what got, it's about. It's still a bear market. Yeah, That's I it. think so too. Uh, next chart, Amazon. Same thing. Well, so not, not quite. In, a, it's not in the gap yet. Yeah, it'll, it'll get there. Uh, Walmart Island reversal. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Walmart, boom, gap filled. Ugh. Heartbreaking. Tough. Tough. What does this do to you? Like, what does this do to your psychology? It's tough. It's like that. It's uh, it's backbreaking. It's tough. Um. All right. So let's now. Now some of the stocks that never even. I mean, Meta had a little bit of a bounce, but that's that's taken out those 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 will not hold. Uh, put that back, Meta. Back on. Oof. <sighs> that looks very bottomy though. Mm. Like if it does if it does reverse higher from here and doesn't take out that June and August low, it's. I like, would agree. I would agree. It's it's something new now. I would agree. I might go fishing. I might go fishing. Um, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. You wouldn't, um, you wouldn't short this year. No. And actually, if I if I put my JC Perrett's head on, watch for a false breakdown. Watch for it. A little dip. Uh, a little dip below on low volume that quickly reverses. And then the oops, the classic oops. All right, look at Carvana. Look at this piece of junk. Look at that bounce. Yeah. Oh my God! Um, it, is it down fifty percent in a in, in a week and a half? The stock went from twenty to sixty in a month. Back to 35. <laughs> Too bad it was 400. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, chart of the pandemic. I was talking, again, sorry for repeating. If you're listening, if you're listening to Animal Spirit tomorrow, I apologize in advance because we spoke about this chart, but now you can see it real time. This is one of the charts of the pandemic, and there's many, but this is one of them. ExxonMobil, this is the market cap of ExxonMobil divided by Zoom. And as you can chart. see, it went below one, meaning that Zoom had a larger market cap than ExxonMobil. Nature is healing. Exxon is now 16 times larger. This is madness. And that's a combination of Exxon going up a lot and Zoom just absolutely losing all. It's a it's a $24 billion market cap now. I think it was, it was a, I think it was a it was 150. Um 
they continue to find ways to disappoint. This is a very impressive company. Uh, I think I think the guy's going to be gone, uh, the CEO at some point. I think he's going to he's going he's gonna to step back or something. They cannot get it together. So obviously, you're still lapping the pandemic and the lockdowns, and those those comps are still tough. And now you're fighting Microsoft and Google. Google, I'm, you're in a knife fight with with you're you're in a I shouldn't even say a knife fight. You're in like a nuclear war with uh, two companies that have unlimited you know who resources buy Zoom? and reach. Uh, Salesforce. That's interesting. It would be it would it would be a pretty big deal. Like I think Slack was its biggest deal, and Slack was not Slack as was, big as Zoom. Slack was twenty. I think I think maybe thirty. Right, maybe but 30. This, uh, this would have to be like thirty something. Um, so Zoom's revenue growth is just I mean it's eight percent year over year, which obviously for like a growth stock is pretty horrible. It's been just just sequential. It's been single digits for the last one two for the last five quarters is, or six is not. The bottom line. The bottom line is it has no. The, it, the bottom line is it has no moat. Um, it was very successful getting people to use it unpaid. Um, but increasingly, small, midsize, and large enterprises are bundling all of their telecom together. And that feature, video calls, are just like, it's like a, a thing they're throwing in. What do you but got? But this surprised the Daniel shit out of son. me. <laughs> Go ahead. This surprised the hell out of me. How many uh, enterprises businesses do you think are paying them over a hundred thousand a year i know this is like a ridiculous question how would you even begin to guess but guess Ten thousand. okay i, th I well three thousand i thought that sounded high so they're actually doing well in that space That's what a lot dude three thousand people three thousand companies 3, 000, paying a hundred grand 3, where they're so losing where they're losing mm -hmm. individual consumers are not paying 15 bucks a month for Zoom, not happening. No. Why would why, like why would you if you have if you're a Gmail account, you have video call, right? I, so I'm much more a Google Meet guy these days. It's so much easier. Would, would you if I like didn't show you the skin around the video and I put you in a Google Meet or a Zoom, would you even know? Like, would you um, know the difference? Quality no, I mean wise? Zoom. No. Zoom might be a little bit slicker, but who cares? Anyway, so so this this chart is disgusting. So I I made a chart of Zoom Peloton. Teladoc, DocuSign, Roku, Wayfair, and Square. These seven companies had a peak market cap of almost $500 billion. They've erased 400 of it. And how bearish does this chart look? This looks like 100 is going to break heavy. These are the stocks when Joe Terranova was talking about last week. He was saying there's V recoveries, there's U recoveries, and then there's L recoveries. Um, not all of those names, but I feel like a lot of these stocks, the best you could hope for is an L where it just stops getting worse. But there's no reason to dream up a scenario where all of a sudden there's a reacceleration of growth. Like what would have to happen that we're all back locked in our houses again, like monkeypox? Um, you know what's, put that chart back on real quick, John. But look how nasty that is. You know, what's, you know what's really fucked up though? These stocks are now lower than where they were collectively than before the pandemic. Like Zoom, Zoom has a lower market cap now than in January 2020. Does that make any sense to you? So this is what's so interesting, and we've spoken about this and Noah on the show and others, is that the pandemic broke everything because these companies collectively and individually are so much larger for the most part than they were prior to, to prior to the pandemic. But yeah, their multiples they, expanded they like so fifty x their their customers. They're much bigger. Shopify is way bigger, and I think it's lower than it was pre pandemic. Why? We're in a different macro environment, and not only is, is revenue uh, expansion not being uh, supported, money losers, which is what these companies are for the most part, are just being annihilated. It's just a different environment. Okay. Between now and a year from now, which is more likely to be all, like gone, like bought out, Zoom or DocuSign? I feel like DocuSign has way more buyers. A, like Adobe? Yeah. Like, how is that not done already? What are they doing? Just, 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 you got to sell it. You got to team up. You got to do what Slack did. You're a feature. You're not a company. It's, it's cool. Be a feature. Cash out. Still 12 right. billion. Still um, 12 billion. I, how has that not been acquired for 20 billion yet? It uh, makes no, no sense I, to they me. They have any debt. Uh, where are we going next? No debt. Okay. Uh, I, I got nothing. Oh, I just, on the bounce, just like my, my quick spiel. And then I, I got one more chart on this and we can move on. <sighs> We talked about positioning, gasoline prices falling was huge. A lot huge. of consumer discretionary stocks got that benefit, restaurants, et cetera. 
Um, and just people, people were short or out in large numbers. And we saw the entirety of the sentiment shift, I think, that we're going to see. If you're still bearish after the last two months, you're staying bearish. Like, I don't, I don't, if this didn't change anything for you, I don't know what does um, because the earnings aren't going to get better, right? So, like, From what here? Are you no, at? I don't think so. Okay. Um, but we're still in this downtrend. I was amazed. We don't, I, didn't, I didn't ask for this chart, but I was amazed at how perfectly we were turned away at the falling 200 day. It eh, happens. I'm not, I know, but it was like, wow. It was within, within a, a hair of that. And if it would have reclaimed it, today's show would be very different. <laughs> like if, if, if it would have ta- if it would have retaken on Friday that 200 day Monday could have been a gap up 1,000 point open on the day. Oh, easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So to, so it's for me it's like a what if that I guess we'll I guess we'll never know. Um, and now we're looking at things like a second half recession in Europe, which I think is guaranteed. We're looking at uh, rationing electricity in in uh, Germany and France. We're looking at uh, a home heating crisis uh for certain like i don't i really don't see a way around it and then there's this chart let's throw this up from your denny like i always used to make fun of charts like this it's a lot going on here because it's like oh look two lines both going up at the same time they must be related this is really directly related it cannot be an accident it cannot be an accident that the moment the fed began to shrink its balance sheet uh, stocks stocks had their first correction since the pandemic. Like it, it can't to me. Yes, it, it can. It, well, what? Um, look at look at the way up. Do you think that stocks corrected because the Fed was shrinking their balance sheet, or do you think that stocks corrected because uh, inflation was nine percent and people Both. got scared? Why is the Fed shrinking its balance sheet? Right. I mean, this is like a it's an aruboros. It's a snake swallowing its own tail. But the bottom line is. We haven't even felt the effects of actual QT, and uh, that's starting next month. And everyone knows it, so I don't think it's like tradable, but there is going to be a huge difference in how much the Fed is doing out there in the fixed income markets, and we don't know how it's going to go. So I don't think the Fed is deliberately going to try to create a market event, but I don't think it's bullish. Sorry, I, maybe I'm an idiot. I just I don't see it as bullish. This is Ed Yardeni's chart. I just want to quote him. He calls this the ugliest chart of them all. We've saved the worst for last. It's probably the most offshown and most compelling chart included in the PowerPoint presentations of the bears to make their case. It's the S&P 500 stock price index versus the Fed's holdings of U.S. Treasuries, agency debt, and mortgage-backed securities. So uh, QT2, quantitative tightening 2, electric boogaloo, ramps up in September will reduce the Fed's holdings by $95 billion per month on average. And if you were a believer that the Fed was supportive of asset prices on the way up, you can't then say, okay, but now it doesn't matter on the way down. It has to matter for something. You could argue it won't matter that much, but it's going to be a factor. Um, and then the question is like, who's going to buy these bonds if the Fed's not? How are yields going to stay under control? And of course, that'll be what the Fed is most closely watching. So Yardeni kind of, he, he looks at this void and he's basically saying, who are the buyers out there? Commercial banks, the U.S. Treasury itself is not going to be it. Is it bond funds? Is it foreign investors? I don't know if there's enough demand. Um, the last few years. percent might be the new floor. The last few years were very, very good for investors. I don't want to say easy because it's never easy, but the last few years were very good for investors. And so if we have to go through a little bit of a slog, I don't think it's the end of the world. It's going to feel like shit, but it's, it's sort of normal. It's very normal. Uh, bond mutual funds and bond ETFs purchased $87.4 billion of these securities, the uh, mortgage-backed and, and treasuries, over the 12 months through June. That's down from $1.1 trillion during the 12 months into April 2021. Wait, what? So, yeah. Um, bond funds disappeared. Um, they purchased eighty-seven point four billion of of the types of securities that are in the Fed's balance sheet. New purchases, new new money. So now so, r- rates are going up, and people don't want bonds anymore. No, everyone that bought that one up to the one point one trillion record high, twelve months, twelve months bond funds bought one point one trillion in treasuries and mortgage bonds. You know what happened? They all just lost their asses. So where's the appetite going to come from? They all just got killed. 
all of that, all of that purchasing is underwater. So I, you know, our, so our foreign, our foreign investors are still buying a lot of bonds. A lot of that is reserve related, FX related. If you trade with the United States, by definition, you're going to have treasury holdings. Um, but like, I just, I, I think that that's really that like you could mock that chart like, oh, look, it's two lines going up at the same time. I think it's very, very meaningful. I don't see how you're getting multiple expansion. And we already know earnings growth is going to be tougher over the next two quarters than any two quarters we've seen since the pandemic. So that's, that's, where, I, that's where I am uh, mentally. But we, we got to move. Um, what do you think about this premise that recession or not, what's really going on is just a normalization? And we've had the most distorted economy of all time in the last three years. And normalization is a better way to think of it than like, oh, it's a it's an economic recession. It's a recession compared to maybe last year's numbers. Yes, of course, technically, if growth is down or negative, yes. But all we're really doing is just normalizing something that was completely uh, weird um, and went on for like two and a half years. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, so Westbury was basically saying anything that we have from 2020 through 22, just rip it out and focus on pre-pandemic data. Yeah. But I think that the, the everything looks so different today than it did in 2019 because people are still spending. We are seeing a massive shift from goods to services. Um, but that will run its course, and yeah. then those two things will go back into balance probably next year when everyone gets to travel out of their system and all that. So the point is, um, our mutual friend Dave, he's in private equity. So all day long, he's analyzing private companies. And they're showing him their EBITDA from uh, 2021. And he's like, what the hell are you showing me this for? This is, this, is, this is from Jupiter. Show me your 2018 number. Show me your 2019. I'm going to average those two, and I'm going to say that's your business. And we're doing that in the stock market, in a, obviously, in a, in a crowdsourced way. Um, and that's why we're getting, that's why we're getting uh, the moves that we've gotten all year, because 2021 was la-la land, and 2022 is for services. So uh, it I is like this, I like this quote. What, you have, a, you have a chart? You got it. Go. I like this quote. He said, we don't expect a recession like in 2020 or a repeat of the Great Recession in 08, 09. But the unemployment rate will eventually go up, job growth will go negative, industrial production will fall, and so will corporate profits. At that point, we won't have a big debate about whether we're in a recession. Everyone will know it. And I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm with that. Bloomberg says uh, market odds of a recession now are at 47%. Not 100% sure, like the expectations. I'm not 100% sure how they calculated the market's expectations, mm -hmm. but that's flip a coin territory. We spoke about this with Joe Terranova and... Assuming we don't take out the lows, which, you know, we might, we might not, who knows. It would be so crazy if the bear market is more or less over, or at least it reached its, its, uh, uh, the bottom before the recession even began in earnest. You know what another thing is possible? Um, and this happened, this actually happened. Like, um, a lot of stocks bottomed in September, October of 2008. But then the overall stock market kept going lower. And like one by one, various stocks just stopped going down. That's another option. We could see S&P 3,400 by the end of this year. But there could be a lot of stocks right now that just don't go with it. And they, you know, obviously Apple would have to be part of that. But like if you look at the S&P 100, there could be companies that just it, it's the selling stops. I think people, people have accepted a recession and they, and they refuse to sell. We've been so, I don't know if condition is the wrong word, but people still are, have, have mental scar tissue from 08, 09, that mm. a recession equals end of the world. And you can have a moderate recession. Like those are things that actually can happen. Yeah. Oh, you absolutely can. We're, we don't have crashing home prices. In fact, we have home prices that refuse to budge, even though existing home sales are falling off a cliff. New home We're sales now too. at the lowest level of existing home sales uh, back, to, back to 2015. Um, and some housing stats are at 50 year lows right now, but prices aren't doing what you would expect them There's to do. There's a huge spread. The bid ask spread between where buyers and sellers are meeting is a mile wide. Because you're, you're still at three months worth of inventory. 
It's not like we overbuilt. But I think sellers are anchored to where they could have gotten paid a year ago. And buyers are like, hell no. Do you see what's about to happen? You see mortgage rates? You see, right. do you see so. So which it's got to, so as it has to break one way or another, unless you tell me we're about to build 5 million houses, which I, I don't think you think is going to happen. So I, I think it breaks low. I think price breaks lower, but so what? It went up 40, uh, nationally, home prices went up 40% in two years. There right. were some mate. There were some like second and third tier cities where they went up eighty percent, a hundred percent. Like assuming what? mortgage rates don't go out of control, I think there is a relatively high high floor on how price how low prices could fall because there's still so many more buyers and sellers. I you know the Fed wants to tighten um, financial conditions. I don't think they want to allow mortgage rates to get completely out of control. Like I don't think that's on the menu. I don't see who that's. I don't know who that serves. Peter Peter Brookvar says that. Um, the housing market is roughly 15 to 18% of GDP each year. Like if you take and psychologically, like, it's a bigger slice of the pie, even bigger in people's lives. It's like 80% of what it's, they it's, think. It's, their it's, net it's worth all they is. know. It's all they know. All right. Um, profit estimates are coming down. We keep talking about this, but they are coming down. Uh, this chart, I think it's from Gina Martin. It's from Gina Martin Adams, uh, of Bloomberg. Uh, look at starting in Q3, 2022, what we're showing is the orange bar is where, Estimates were before earnings season began, okay. and the gray bars where they are now. So they keep coming down. What are those numbers? Those are those are uh, dollars per share. So the S and P analysts thought the S and P five hundred would earn fifty nine dollars and seventy cents per share, and it earned fifty seven. That's for no. That's the estimates for the next quarter. That's for Q three. Okay, yeah, yeah. got it, got it. So that's good. So, uh, okay, but so earnings uh, surprised slightly to the upside correct the but my point is in. we need to lower earnings so that when we do miss previous estimates stocks don't crash right if you, you could lower you could lower estimates and then the stocks report it's not as bad as people feared and then we could you know deal with it then. okay so when is earnings lowering season <laughs> i feel like we just went through that everyone gave their guidance got a few more company i have a few more stocks left uh still to report but i think we have guidance and by the way probably- earnings is is so mixed some companies uh, are absolutely either in a combination of a recession or they mismanaged whatever, whatever. And then other companies are like business has never been better. We don't see any any slowing. We're seeing acceleration in certain in certain segments. It is really, really, really a mixed bag more than I can ever remember. There's two things that I keep hearing now is like, oh no, 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 you don't have to worry about 2022. It's 2023 is the real story. So I keep hearing that one. And then the new thing that like uh, Marco Kalanovic from uh, JP Morgan, who I think is very good. Um, he thinks we'll finish the year at 4,800, which would be like a flat year for the market. Um, and he's basically saying, you know, the, don't worry about earnings. Uh, you have enough buybacks and short covering that will take us, you know, back to flat on year. So he's another positioning guy, I guess. Like that's, that seems to be the, the, the fulcrum of, of his argument. Um, I want to do this thing on factors. So... Cliff Asnes, who I love when he writes, um, did a post about everybody. I, I mean, maybe he's talking about me, but like pundits in the media just mindlessly repeating that uh, value outperforms when rates are going up. I and felt seen too. I felt seen too from when he said this. Well, you know, I, just, well, yeah. Yeah. So, so th- th- the argument is like, oh no, value doesn't need interest rates to go up. It just so happens that over the last five years, those two things are highly correlated. And when rates go down, growth stocks start outperforming. And, and the reason people keep saying is, oh, it's a long duration asset. But it is. You know, their earnings are far out in the future. But it but is. He's saying, but he's saying, like, go back 50 years and that relationship Forget doesn't Forget about really 50 exist. years. So Cliff is right. And far be it for me to challenge him because I have a ton of respect for Cliff. And I love him. And he's a great writer and much smarter than me, et cetera, et cetera. And he's a fellow love, bald. You love him? A fellow bald. I do love Cliff. I'm a big fan of his. Okay. Um, but, he's, but he wrote, frankly, the assumption of so many pundits who state when value versus growth has been trading correlated to interest rates and they desperately need something to say, that it makes perfect He's sense me. <laughs> as growth cash flows are much longer dated. is just wrong. They should stop repeating these easy, facile, mistaken, and misleading observation. I predict as much success in my effort to change the dialogue here as I normally achieve. That made me laugh. But yeah. here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think he's wrong, at least in the short term, because... He might be right over like long periods of time. I agree that it's not as simple as interest rates up 
value outperforms growth. I don't believe that. But today, I do believe that it's true. Look at this next chart. Maybe I'm. Maybe it's just my imagination. No, he's saying it, it over the last five years. It's like undeniable. Okay. He say he's he's saying that. Okay. So so here's here's the undeniability. We've got the the orange line is the ten year treasury rate. Okay. Case case closed. What else do you want to say? Case closed. So it, as as treasury rates went up, the purple line, which is the Nasdaq 100, went down. Literally, as they as the orange line peaked, the purple line stopped going down. The purple line started going up as the orange line started coming down, and then the orange line started stopped going down and started going back up. And the Nasdaq did the opposite. They are inversely correlated. I don't care what the numbers say. Right now, this this does matter. Does it matter always, forever, over longer periods of time? Probably not, but it matters today. Uh, it matters today, and these relationships are subject to change. Always, every relationship. I, I'm old enough to remember when bad inflation meant gold prices would rally. Good night. You know what I mean? Like gold, gold was doing gold was doing better from 2010 to 2020 during disinflation. So what the hell is that about? So all, all of the, all of these relationships that people like have this facile comment that they make are subject to change. But while they're in force, I mean, it's it's true. It's true today. Andrew Love like wrote a book about this. The adaptive market hypothesis was really good. Is that the market is more like a biological than anything else, and everything is is constantly evolving and changing. One thing, uh, if I were to have a conversation with Cliff about this, I don't think he's interested, but. Um, he rhetorically asks, quote, so why has value versus growth been trading the way it has in recent times? Put simply, I don't know. Correlation like fertilizer happens. But that won't stop me from taking a guess. If we're in a bubble, then many must be assuming their growth portfolio is more like the unicorn. All right. It, it's, too, it's too much to get into. I think, that, I think the answer to that is pretty simple also. And again, this doesn't have to be true forever. But when rates are going down, why does growth start to outperform value? I think it could be as simple as managers are then saying, well, if I'm not getting economic growth, then I need secular growth. And they start selecting for the types of stocks that are going to grow regardless of the economy. If rates are going up, theoretically, that means people are feeling good about economic growth. Therefore, you can buy the cyclicals, which tend to be value stocks. So that would be, that would be my theory. And again, I, I wouldn't like... I wouldn't say, okay, stamp that in. It's good forever. I'm just saying that's what, what it feels like right one now. One other thing that Cliff has spent a lot of time researching is that he like sector neutraled all of this stuff. So it's yeah. not it's not just that tech stocks are outperforming. He's like, no, 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 stop. Once you, sector. Yeah, like yeah. if you look at the, ch the, the cheap materials versus the expensive materials, like forget about sectors. It's not all about sectors. Like there's more to it than that. It is truly expensive growth, outperforming value. But anyway, I think I think we're, we're not so far apart. There, there was another... Yeah, Here's ahead. another piece. Uh, small cap value should eventually start outperforming. If you look at history and Verdad has a piece about how cheap small caps are, not just small cap value, but small cap relative to large cap, just straight up valuation. Um, uh, this is Verdad. As small cap underperformed of late and the discounts widened to levels not seen in about 50 years, expected relative returns going forward may have increased again. So there are small chart. cap managers. So. Throw up this blue, this blue line. What they're look so okay, there it is. The discount of the S and P six hundred, which are small caps to the S and P five hundred. They're, they're using enterprise value to sales. I'm sure it looks very much the same based I'm on sure any it's metric. The same thing on everything else. Yeah. So I mean, this like how far can this really go before it re before it reverses? I feel like it's. I would not bet on uh, on a further uh, widening of this discount. I think that would be a really dumb bet. Um, but both can rally at the same time and the discount could remain. That's another possibility. Uh, or you get two years of kick-ass small cap performance and a flat large cap, you know, a flat S&P. Like, I don't know what would cause that. Um, here, pull this, pull this up. This is, uh, this is showing that from 1963 to 2022, small cap value crushed the field. And obviously not every year during that period I take period these with time, a grain of salt. The data is what it is, but I take it with a grain of salt. Why? It's just 1960. What, I mean, it's, it's a long time. No, but what do you think the data is not accurate from no, the no, 60s? No, 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 that's not, that's not what I mean. Uh, no, if you look, if you, properly has changed in the market? No, 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 no. I'm just saying, look at rolling returns. Look at rolling outperformance of over like five and 10 year periods. And it just paints a different picture. I just don't like long-term numbers like this. That's all. I like context. Yeah, I think there was a, I think... 
the small cap outperformance like really came in two streaks, two bursts. It was it was the the seventies uh, and eighties. Yeah, and it was after uh, it was the O's, the aughts. The aughts, because so many large caps were crashing from really high valuations. All right, I want to um, I want to talk about anything else. What I was going to ask you, like, what if this whole thing is is a pointless exercise? Like, what if separating the market into growth versus value, and then focusing on one or the other is just not the right way to invest? Um, is that, like, is that possible? Well, because because here's why I'm asking that. If what if by doing that, all we're doing is picking industries and sectors and then waiting for them to be in favor. And then when the industries that have cheap stocks are in favor, then you're like, look at my style. It worked, you know. Well, like, that's what? why you diversify. I mean, right? Maybe you want to buy stocks when they're value stocks and as they get expensive, instead of selling them to find more cheap stocks, like just saying, well, why are they more expensive now? And maybe this can continue. Um, but that would be marrying value and momentum. And I think we, we've talked a lot about that. But I, it's this concept that like, oh, I want to separate the, the market by growth hey, and value. Hey, get used what? to it. It's not going anywhere. All right, fine. I'm done. Um, all right. Uh, let's talk about stocks. You know, stocks are not the economy, right? Like, I think they are. They aren't. Sometimes sure they aren't. Yeah, yeah. However, 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 over during the bounce, uh, people and maybe I'm just like people like myself, like – well, actually, maybe things aren't so bad. Like you can get fooled into thinking that like the stock market is the economy sometimes. Okay. Do you know more. what I mean? Say more. I'm just saying that people thought that the world was falling apart in mm. June. And then stocks bounced and people all of a sudden felt a lot better. Now, 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 in fairness, stocks bounced for a reason, right? Stocks did bounce for a reason because things aren't so bad. But it's just, it's just interesting how you can talk yourself into X or Y based on where stocks are going. If you listen to the credit card companies, you did not think the world was coming to an end because they're like, they're, that's the, the credit card companies are in the center of everything, goods and services. And they're like Amex. They're like, it's full speed ahead. What are you talking about? And like, even anecdotally, you and I, this summer, we've been to, we've been to like nice restaurants on a Monday night. And there's a, a, a there's like a, a line out the door to get in. Like that's thing, not, thing, that's things not do not bear market. It's not recessionary. In my corner of like the that. world, things do not feel like a, bear, uh, a recession, not even a little bit, not even a little bit. Um, yeah. I also wonder if a lot of the retail stuff that, that really truly was inventory was a bit of a red herring and threw everybody off to thinking that the consumer was in worse shape than they actually were. It's not that they're in bad shape. It's that there comes a point when they bought all the shit they're going to buy. Look, there's a, you know, Weber, you know, Weber grills. Yeah, I, I saw that, that press release. Like, this is a company that came public like one year too late, basically. They came public via SPAC. They already fired the CEO, I think. The stock was an epic crash. Think about what they have going on. Everybody already Ridic bought barbecues. Impossible supply chain situation, right. ridiculously high commodity prices for making metal grills, and everyone bought one last year. Right. Like, how, how, like so if, if, if you are cherry picking stories like that, you could talk yourself into we're in a recession. Or you can have the context to say, like we were saying just now, it's a distortion and we're working our way out of it. It's not normal. We're, get, we're trying to get to normal. I'm sure whatever Weber's, Weber grills were selling, you know, whatever quantity they were selling uh, barbecues for in 2018, 2019 is where this will end up. Why are, we, why are we comping to 2021? It's ludicrous. I also so want to point out this chart that I found in Sam Rowe's terrific Substack. This is from BlackRock. This, this, is this, this is an amazing chart. Okay, this is very clear, but I'm just gonna say it anyway. What we're looking at is within the S&P 500, uh, mm. so, so this is a uh, stocks are not the economy type thing. Within the S&P 500, goods represent 62% of earnings. All right, so things that you buy. And services represent the other 38%. Within the actual economy, uh, goods are only 32%. And yeah. services are 59%. Yeah, the S&P is overweight companies that make things. Like uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. I don't know what I just thought of uh, that. How about Apple? How about so, Apple? Fine. Right. So the so S&P the so is overweight relative to the day-to-day -day economy in 
uh, in in things that you actually physically pick up and hold. But so here's um, but so here's here's the so what here's the coup de gras uh, from BlackRock. Goods accounted for less than a third of the U.S. economy in the first half of the year, um, but a boom in services doesn't power S and P 500 earnings. That's right. As much as it does the economy. That's right. So you, Disney, all of these yeah. tr travel things. It's very great simple. for the economy, not great very for the simple. Look at very simple. Look at the market cap. Look at the market cap of all of the car rental companies put together versus Tesla. Like very, very simple. Like it, there's no way you're going to get the earnings growth correlated to the growth in services this year, which we all understand is pronounced. Anyone that's been to an airport anytime recently understands what's going on. Right. So, but the market is not, the market is kind of seeing through that. I think the market like must collectively, we all understand this and we understand that the S and P is more heavily weighted to durable goods than our actual lives. Right. So that's, that's, I think that's normal. Um, Jay Luther chimed in and said, just like stocks aren't the economy, neither is Batnick. You have to accept that you are not the economy. And I have to, I have to accept that also. Like, you know, I have my lived experience in the economy, but that's not the economy. It's my I'm economy. Not the economy. Okay. You are not. I thought I you was. are the highway. All right. My friend. Um, all right. Okay. Last topic. Let's go. Uh, there go the movie theaters. Can we talk about, um, can we talk about AMC? I mean, we can't not talk about AMC. Uh, any, any hot takes today or, uh, let, or this week? Can I just, just for those who are unaware of what's going on and, and uh, I'll put my hand, I, I haven't spent much time reading about what's going on. I just see the headline. I'm obsessed. I read about nothing else. Okay. So here's, here's Matt, here's Matt Levine. So you, you probably saw that there's like this ape thing going on. Like what is that? That just started trading yesterday. Here's the deal. A, I'm quoting Matt Levine, the great Matt Levine. Uh, by the way, when I read Matt Levine, I read him in the uh, the John Oliver voice. I feel like they're the same person. Ooh, they're very droll. Yeah, like they're, they're the Matt same. Is, but Matt is like New York Jewish. They're the same character, John Oliver just different is geographies. Cockney British. Yeah. All right, AMC is limited to issuing 524 some on million shares of common stock. It has issued 516 million of those, leaving about 7.4 million to spare. Um, in round numbers, AMC is out of shares to issue. So like, this is me talking in their like charter, they can only issue so many shares without going and back to the board. The okay. Um, so it can't sell more shares to raise money and it can't issue more shares to, for instance, attract new employees or buy new gold mines, LOL. On the other hand, AMC has preferred shares. Its certificate of incorporation authorizes it to issue up to 50 million shares of preferred stock. Um, AMC issued a dividend after Friday's close of one preferred equity unit for each share of the common in effect putting in place a two-for-one stock split. The preferred yeah. shares traded for the first time on Monday on the, on the NYSE under the ape symbol. So that's what's going on. So if you held AMC on Friday, you woke up Monday, you had one share of AMC and one share of ape. Nice little and, airdrop, nice little airdrop. And the price of AMC was cut in half and there's an uproar in the ape community because <laughs> the media misreported it. The media is like, AMC crashes 44%. Okay, well, and, that is true. And it's a legitimate... That is true. Like, it's a totally legitimate gripe. It's like, don't make the headline a piece of bullshit like that and then explain in the third paragraph why it's not that. But the, in, it's, in fairness to the people that write the articles, and you know this better than I do, they're, they're not the choice. ones They're not the ones that are making the headline. And I'm sure they're like cringing at the headline, but listen, it's for clicks. That's what it is. Well, it's a click. It's a, the whole economy is, is now we based on... on clicks. Clicks and nudes, we and that's just clicks. that's Yo, the only this, thing we do now. Look at this! Look at this chart. I want to show like good corporate governance versus uh, not great corporate governance. I'm looking well, at. I want to ask you about. I want to ask you about okay, this ahead. actually. So we had Jim Chanos on uh, CNBC. Josh, today. look at this. So I'm looking at. I, I made a chart of shares what outstanding. Is on the top oh, is AMC. Yeah. And just flooding the market, literally like quintuple the amount of shares. Basically, retail save re meme investors save them from bankruptcy. True story. And then on the bottom, you've got Apple, which is, uh, I, 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 you know, it's silly to compare the two, but just shrinking you know, its share count. You want well, shares going down, not up. Well, one company has the most profitable business in history in the app store. 30, 30, a third of every dollar spent on apps all over the world on the highest income people in the world's phones are going directly to one company. Nice little The business. other company sells stale popcorn. So it's not like... <laughs> Totally shocking. We, so we had uh, we had Chanos on, uh, and he is short um, Ape. No, no, no. no. I have AMC. it backwards. AMC. He's short AMC, and he's long Ape 
And his argument is they're, the same they're thing. both economically the same security right. so that price difference will close and it'll close in favor of uh, Ape going down. But doesn't there have to be like – doesn't there have to be like rational economic actors? No. What the fuck are you talking about? It's no, that's what Chanos is assuming. Why should they trade at the same price? <laughs> well, I mean – why should why should a lot of things happen? No, I know they should trade at the same price, but why why should they? Given what we know about the shareholders, no offense. No, it, listen, it'll close one way or the other. Um, it could close in the form. It could close. You in think the it's form. be that easy? I, I don't think so. I don't no, think so. No, but listen, let me finish the sentence. It could close in the form of AMC ripping up higher to match the price of Ape, and then everyone going, "What? No, it, how did ape, that just happen? Slower, ape slower. Ape slower. Whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so he takes issue with what Adam Aaron has done, and a lot of people have looked at this and said it's a cash grab or it's taking advantage of shareholders. But it's an interesting governance question. I asked him about this, and he he really didn't have a uh, he really didn't have like a a very um, doctrinaire answer. But I I was basically like Jim, pretend that you're not a professional investor. Pretend you're the C the CEO of AMC. What do you do? Like the guy is dealt a shitty hand. He's a movie theater chain in a pandemic, and there's excitement over his stock. What he's saving? He's saving the company, or he thinks he's saving the company. Whatever. He's obviously owns a lot of stock himself, so he's saving himself. But like, what should he do? Close up? Like I, I guess like from a governance perspective, yes, he's taking advantage of shareholders because he's now going to repeatedly sell this ape thing to raise money. But what's the alternative? Is AMC and ESG? Oh, because he's like looking at he's looking out for his shareholders. No, but but like what what's the answer to that? What is the I don't know. What is the quote unquote right thing to do if you're Adam Aaron right now? I feel like he thinks he's doing the right thing. I think that the obvious thing would be that he's taking advantage of of uh, of share of a, of a unsophisticated shareholder base. What what if he doesn't? What happens to the shareholder base then? It's a, it's a, it's a zero. Does, everybody, does nobody understand this? Okay, but you could say, okay, listen. I'm taking advantage of you to save your investment. No, no, no. Existing equity shareholders get wiped out in a bankruptcy. So or, that's better? Or the alternative is bring in all of these new equity investors that will ultimately get wiped out. I'm not saying that they will get wiped out. I have no idea. But you can Oh, no, say they will. <laughs> if he doesn't do this, the banks, are, the banks are probably done loaning them money. There's probably not a big market for debt for, for AMC right now. I could be wrong. Um, if he doesn't do this, the shareholders have nothing anyway. So this idea that he's taking advantage of, of shareholders, what's the alternative? I, I'm not saying I know the answer, but I can't think of what else would you do here? So part of me feels like he's a hero. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't, but I just don't think this situation is as black. One. Anyway, it's sad because you love going to the movies in real life. And so do I, and I always have, let's do some charts real quick. This is AMC Holdings. I've been going to the movies like like a madman this uh, yeah. this summer. Yeah, and it's you basically have the theater to yourself, so you know that can't last. Actually, yeah, this, bodies, bodies, bodies. I had like twenty people there. Put up this uh, the Cinemark. This is the owner of Regal, I think, or no, the other one, Cineworld, is the owner of Regal. I, I don't know Regal. what Cinemark owns. Uh, put this one up. So this was, not I guess it's a foreign company owns this, and um, this looks really bad. So this company is basically a bankruptcy. I did the uh, the U two. The guy told the ticket. The guy the ticket booth told me to enjoy the movie, and I U two. U two. Yeah. Pop in. Yeah. Pop in. Check it out. With me. What's this? Uh, Apes preferred. Are we doing this? Uh, Who cares? No. All right, we're done. Um, we're Duncan. Gonna do fewer topics. Get in here. Where's Duncan? Hey guys. You son of a gun. Good do afternoon, you think, handsome. Do you think Ape deserves a premium because it's a cooler ticker? See? Uh, you see? Josh, you see what I'm talking about? Now, that's what I call <laughs> smart beta. <laughs> uh, um, hey, everyone. Uh, thanks thanks for coming out tonight. We have a great How long have you been sitting on that, audience. Duncan? Uh, How long just for been? like you know, two minutes. Um, two hours. <laughs> yeah, two hours. Um, yeah, we, we have a great, uh, a great crowd tonight. Over 1,000 chat comments just to show you how active... The, the how many? founder community is. That's how gangster. many did you say? We love you guys. Over, over a thousand. Nice. We love you guys. And look at all the bees. Duncan, you're a star. All right, let's get to it. We're, time, is, uh, time is running out. Okay, so up first, we have um, a really non-contentious uh, question about student loans. So uh, Cameron writes, what are your thoughts on what will happen to the economy when $18 billion in monthly student loan payments are turned back on? It seems as though turning payments back on would significantly affect consumer spending and savings. 
And this is a, a timely question, too, right? Because tomorrow we're hearing that Biden might announce cancellation of some sort. I mean, this is this is going to this is going to piss people off. And I don't mean this callously, but 18 billion dollars is just not that much money. So the interest on 18 billion is not that much money. And that's what we're talking about when they say 18 billion in monthly student loan payments are turned back on. Like it's that those are the interest payments. The the dollar amount of all of the debt is a lot. But like whether or not the 18 billion is coming into the economy or not, I wish it I wish it were more meaningful. Um, I just, I don't know that it is. Do you know what yeah. retail sales are on an annual basis? I'll tell you. Uh, almost 6 trillion. Yeah. Uh, so, so break that down by monthly. So you say 18 billion in monthly student loan payments versus so 18, a month of retail. 18, 18 billion into 6 trillion. That's 0.3%. So it matters a lot more to individuals than it does that's to, exactly to right. that's what I'm trying to say. The to impact the on people, the impact on people it's, it's is, huge. is huge. crushing. Yeah. But in the overall scheme of the economy, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's noticeable. It's not a factor. Um, next question, Duncan. Okay. So up next, we have a question from Mike. Um, investors say index S and P dollar cost average over time and don't seek alpha, but there are traders like Paul Tudor Jones that have made millions trading commodities. Um, what does Kyle Bass know that I don't, where do I direct my efforts to achieve like they have? Why is there a group of people who believe they can attain alpha? And I guess can in some cases, LeBron James exists, right? Like there are people that absolutely smash the indexes. Like this is not disputable. It's very, very very difficult. 99.9% .9 of investors do not do that. Can I just can I just say that you totally can achieve alpha, but over what period of time? And at what and, cost? And at what cost? To your to personal your, life. To your personal life. And what happens when you stop achieving alpha? How bad do things go for you? Like how, how far how far off of the market do you become based on whatever your trading strategy is? And I want to take a moment to... Uh, just recognize the death of uh, Julian Robertson today. Julian Robertson is widely regarded as one of the greatest investors who ever lived. Not um, much more. Started, Close. Started his, uh, started his fund in 1980. So that's 42 years ago. And there are probably 40 different hedge funds that exist today that we colloquially refer to as Tiger Cubs. And these were fund managers or entire teams that either got their start there or were seeded by him. Um, Julian Robertson was able to generate alpha over a very long period of time at his fund. And then there was an episode in 1999 where he just refused to bite on the tech bubble, the dot-com bubble. He just said, this is not, this is unrecognizable relative to the type of investing that I've done for decades, and I'm not going to do it. And I'm going to close my fund and become a family office and just focus on, because in other words, it's like either you buy into the tech bubble and go for it, or you're trailing so much that everyone's pulling their money out. And he said, let them pull their money out. I'm just not going to do it. And he closed the fund in early 2000. And within a few months, that bubble that he refused to, that game that he refused to play became game over. The NASDAQ fell 90% from its high or 85% from its high. And simultaneously with doing that, he gave the money to young people. He gave the money to Chase Coleman, who is now Tiger Global and has put up monster returns over, over, over the years since. He gave money, I think, to Viking. And there's a whole list uh, of, of people. And in doing that, what he was acknowledging was, this is no country for old men. Like, maybe my time is done. And I'm now gonna close 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 the doors, manage money myself. But it's like the I recognize it's like the I recognize that tree. there's still alpha. So I'm gonna give these guys a shot to do what they do, which will be different than what I do. And that that bit of wisdom, I think, cements him at as one of the ability to say, okay, my time of generating alpha is no longer this time. But I'm gonna give these these young guys a shot to do what they do, and it worked. In a, in a massive way. And I think that's what makes him one of the greatest investors ever. What do you think about that? I think in the hundred yeah, percent, I think uh, nobody has probably has their fingerprints, fingerprints more on the asset management, at least hedge fund industry than he does. In the early eighties, it was him and uh, I guess Steinhardt. Soros and Steinhardt were, were yeah. the three big ones. Yeah, so anyway, Mike, uh, you, you wanna try that? <laughs> so the point is there is alpha and there are people who generate alpha 
But there are very few people who can do that in multiple market regimes. Well, and also these people, the people that do generate it, spend hundreds of millions of dollars to do it and dedicate their life and their employers' li- their employees' lives to, to get yeah. it. It's hard. And, it's not, st- and, somebody, and, they, and they still fail sometimes. It's not all that the you time. can't do it, but it's, it's hard. I mean, and yeah, so I think if, you, if your idea of getting rich is generating alpha in the market, it's, and you're not already on track, like working at 0.72 for Steve Cohen, like it's, it's very unlikely that that's how you're going to get rich. It's more likely if you focus on your own career, you will get rich and you can use the stock market to stay rich. That's how I would, that's how I would answer that question. Um, and I hope that's, a, I know it's not a satisfying answer, but it's, you know, it's, you know, it's the truth because of ha- the degree to which it's unsatisfying. All right, Duncan, and, we have anything else? Uh, just one other, one follow up for our, um, young investors watching alpha is just outperformance basically. Yeah. Alpha okay. is how, how much ahead of a given benchmark your, your fund or your strategy is. So alpha exists. It's scarce. It's hard to maintain. Um, once you find it, it becomes very difficult to change what you're doing if the market changes and keep it. And uh, I'm a beta guy. Sh- nobody I'm should a, think it's a given. I'm a beta guy myself. I have always said that you are a beta male. So we can end on that note. Uh, congratulations to Mike on the new jet ski. Rest in peace, Julian Robertson. Great job tonight on the charts. John, great job, Nicole, Duncan. Guys, our Twitter account is at the Compound News on Twitter. We are on the verge of breaking through 25,000 followers. So if you are a Twitter person, why not? Follow the compound on Twitter. Okay, we're going to see you guys next week. Don't forget, tomorrow is an all-new episode of Animal Spirits with Mike and Ben on the podcast when you wake up. Good night. Good night.